The Lord be with you. And also with you. How good it is to be here today, and we welcome each and every one of you. We welcome those of you that are joining us from home or wherever you may be. The order of service for those of you that are watching us is located on the link right near the picture there. Uh, today's order of service is Divine Setting 3, and <clears throat> today we hear all about the topic of tax collectors and sinners. I know I fit into one of those categories, if not both, and I'm sure that you will find by the end of today that you do too. And therefore, we need God's forgiveness. So let us receive that forgiveness of God. As first, we begin by singing our opening hymn, hymn number 609, Jesus Sinners Doth Receive. Thank you. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgive the iniquity of my sins. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. And upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ, announce the grace of God unto you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. O Lord, my God, I cry to you in O Lord, you have brought me up, and you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord. His anger is but a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. <laughs> Glory be to God on high.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are the good shepherd without whom nothing is secure. Rescue and preserve us that we may not be lost forever, but follow you, rejoicing in the way that leads to eternal life. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The Old Testament lesson for the 14th week after Pentecost is from the prophet Ezekiel, the 34th chapter. <clears throat> for thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so, so will I seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. And I will bring them into their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravens and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pastures they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture and to drink of clear water that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet? And must my sheep eat what you have trotted with your own feet and drink what you have muddied with your feet? Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you push with side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. And he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Our epistle is from the first letter of Timothy, the first chapter. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and his sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, 
desiring to be teachers of the law, without understanding either what they are saying or the things about what about which they have confident assertions. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for sexually immoral men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. I thank you, or I thank him, who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insultant opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Gospel according to St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me! For I have found my lost or my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, 
begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for our meditation this morning, today's gospel from Luke 15, in the name of Jesus. Amen. In 1 Samuel 22, David was on the run from King Saul, and all sorts of men who were troubled and anxious came to him, and he received them willingly, prefiguring his great descendant, Jesus, who in a similar way not only welcomed repentant sinners, but also defended his reception of them against those who criticized him for it. This informs and shapes the two parts of today's gospel. First, how the tax collectors and sinners drew near to Jesus. And second, how he put the disapproving scribes and Pharisees in their place. Previously, Jesus had called to himself all who labor and are heavy laden. And had promised them that he would give them rest. For their souls. He made it clear that he was the true physician of the soul who had come to earth to help the spiritually sick. Such words the tax collectors and sinners had taken to heart, and so they dared to draw near to him. Mind you, tax collectors were unjust, greedy men who not only collected taxes for the Roman government, but went on to extort more from the people than they owed, and so became rich off the labors of their countrymen. In numerous ways, they threatened and intimidated people. No wonder they were hated by many. Jesus himself said that, the, that a godless person who refused to repent was to be treated as a heathen and a tax collector. They were evil men. Now the term sinner here does not refer to someone who falls prey to temptation because of his human weakness. It refers to those who live in manifest and open sin and who are steeped in the shame of their sin. Such were the people, the tax collectors and sinners who were drawing near to Jesus. They were well aware of their great misdeeds, their gross departure from God's will, and they drew near to Jesus because of the weight of sin on their heart and their conscience. They drew near in order to be comforted by his preaching. The scribes and Pharisees also heard Jesus preaching, but it brought no comfort to them because they believed they were already righteous on account of their own keeping of the law. Because they looked on, uh, for salvation in themselves, they didn't look for it in Christ. I mean, if, if you think you're rich, why would you accept a handout from someone else? If you think you're healthy, why would you go to a doctor? If you think you're righteous in and of yourself, you're not going to want the grace that Jesus offers in the gospel. You don't think you need it. But such righteousness is really no righteousness at all. It's worn like the emperor's new clothes. In Hans Christian Andersen's tale, the emperor was given a make-believe suit and told it would be invisible to anyone who was unusually stupid. Unwilling, of course, to admit that he couldn't see it. He ended up parading around with nothing on, naked to all the world. That is precisely our reality when we try to stand before God in our own righteousness. For in actuality, we're standing there stark naked. For our righteousness is as fake as the emperor's invisible suit. A pridefulness that insists on its own righteousness is subject to the admonition of Christ in Revelation 3 
There the Son of God warns the congregation in Laodicea that he will spit them out of his mouth for their lukewarm disposition toward him. He says, you claim to be rich, needing nothing, yet you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. How similar was the attitude of the Pharisees in our text. They thought they had it all together where God was concerned, and didn't have a clue as to their miserable condition in the eyes of God. What counsel did Jesus offer the Laodiceans? Obtain from me white garments so that you may clothe yourselves, that the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. This white garment is the righteousness of Christ by which sinners may safely stand before the throne of God. <coughs> but to put on this robe the Pharisees had to recognize their need for it. So the Son of Man says to the Laodiceans, anoint your eyes with salve that you may see. This salve is the knowledge of sin and true repentance. For it's those who can't see their sin who place their trust in their own righteousness. Like an internal injury is more dangerous because it can go undetected more dangerous, too, is our internal pride and trust in our own righteousness. Those who are guilty of outward sins can far more easily be brought to a recognition of their need for the grace of God. This is what Jesus saw in the tax collectors and sinners, but didn't see in the Pharisees and scribes. When confronted with their sinfulness, the tax collectors turned to Christ who covered them with his own perfect righteousness, while the Pharisees sought comfort in their own ability to keep the law, which of course is no comfort at all because it's simply impossible for us to do all that the law demands. So we in our time do well to remember that when anxiety over sin afflicts us, we may turn to Christ Indeed, we must, for in him alone can we find relief. Draw near to God, says James, and he will draw near to you. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. How do we draw near to God? Recognizing that he has already drawn near to us, we repent of our sins and seek his forgiveness. He, in turn, draws nearer yet with his grace. Our sins separate us from God. Repentance closes the gap. Jesus said that he came to call sinners. How did he do this? By calling them to repentance. Unless you repent and become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. This we do. When, like the tax collectors and sinners, we listen to Christ's word and come to him in faith. When the Pharisees and scribes saw that Jesus welcomed tax collectors and sinners, they grumbled as if to say, this man parades around as the Messiah, but look at the company he keeps. If he really were from God, he'd send them packing. But Jesus defended receiving them using a few salient parables. Two of these we have in our text. In the first, he spoke of a shepherd seeking a lost sheep. And when he found it, he threw a party, inviting his friends and neighbors to celebrate with him. The second presents a woman who had lost a coin and searched for it diligently. And when she found it, she too invited her neighbors and friends to share her joy. Jesus concludes both parables with the remarkable words. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This clearly shows what the point of the parables is. Namely, that Christ receives penitent sinners into his grace and forgiveness. Instead of finding fault with that, the Pharisees should have rejoiced like the angels of God rejoice when sinners repent. 
That's what the parables say about the scribes and Pharisees. But what do they say about us? First of all, they show what we were by nature before our Savior searched and found us. Straying sheep and lost coins. Indeed, we were created at the beginning in a state of blessedness so that we could be one flock under one head and shepherd Jesus Christ. He made us to be the sheep of his pasture. And as the king of the land has his imprint and likeness stamped on the coins of the realm, God created us with his image impressed upon our soul. But we didn't remain in such a blessed state, did we? The hellish wolf, Satan, tore the sheep from the fold and the coin of our soul lost its divine likeness. And because all of us come from Adam, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We lost that heavenly imprint, the image of God. That was the sad condition of the human race. And as a sheep and coins can't find themselves, even so, we poor sinners could do nothing by our own power to correct the situation we were in. What could be done for us? The parables show this too. Jesus, God's son, the shepherd and bishop of our souls, the good shepherd, as he calls himself in John 10, came into the wilderness of this world and with great diligence sought us and found us, even as he continues to seek lost sheep of every time and place. As Isaiah says, we all like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yes, as a true shepherd walks through briars and thorns, often going without food and drink until he finds his lost sheep. So Christ in his suffering wore a crown of thorns and cried out, I thirst. His soul worked until death so that he might bring back his lost sheep and lead us into the sheepfold of his church. Or as the writer to the Hebrews puts it, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the crowd of thousands of angels and the assembly of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. People nowadays, even church people, seem so afraid of the concept of repentance. We so dread confronting our sins that as a culture, we just try to eliminate the idea of sin altogether. We justify every behavior and create a societal stigma against the promotion of what's good and right. Ironically, we don't seem to have a problem telling Bible-believing Christians how wrong they are. A pastor friend of mine in California was recently accused of being a heretic for preaching against the unchristian beliefs of wokeism. So these days, repentance is a hard concept for a lot of folks. But repentance is a great thing. God the Father stretches forth his hand every day and bids all people everywhere to repent. The Son of God has commanded that repentance and forgiveness of sins be preached in his name. The Holy Spirit wants to work repentance in us through the word, which is why he convicts the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Here in our text, Jesus tells us that the holy angels rejoice over one, one sinner who repents. What should motivate us to repent is the great kindness and goodness of Christ who has come from heaven into the wilderness of this world to bring us poor lost sheep back to the path of forgiveness and life. 
Nothing grieves him more than to see his merciful kindness despised and rejected. And nothing gives him greater joy than seeing his grace powerfully at work in those who repent. May he help us always, beloved, to cling to his works in repentance and faith, not to our own. For in ourselves we have nothing to shield us from the punishment our sins deserve. But in him we are clothed in perfect righteousness so that we need never fear the wrath and judgment of God. Hallelujah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask you to remain standing. In a moment, the offering plates will be brought forward as we sing the offertory. You, you've noticed that we are not collecting the prayer cards anymore. If you have a prayer request, please fill out a card. You can hand it to an usher or you can hand it to one of us. Um, and please, at, at some point before you leave today, if you haven't done so already, make sure to sign the fellowship register. We appreciate it. Let's continue with the offertory. Our Lord Jesus Christ came down from heaven to seek after us lost sheep and to bring us home rejoicing. Let us call upon him in thanksgiving and petition for ourselves and for all people. O oh, Father in heaven, we pray to you through the Son and the Holy Spirit. Grant that we may daily recognize that you provide for our every need of body and soul. We praise and bless your holy name for these gifts from above. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Almighty God, you call pastors and set them to the task of shepherding your people. Bless them in their work of providing your gifts to those you have gathered. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious Lord, look with favor on the households of our congregation and grant that all may live in love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. O Lord, our King, you appoint princes and all governing authorities. Remember those you have placed in authority over us and grant that they might fulfill their responsibilities according to your word and for the good of your people. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of life, you heal and deliver. 
Hear our cries for all who are in need of strength and rescue. Especially do we pray for Heather, Rick, Shannon, Michael, Juliet, David, Jean, Matt, Cindy, Jeff, Dennis and Judy, Tim, Frank, Shirley, Lana, Michael, Lorena, Mary, Peter, Brenda, Sam, Judy, Karen, Ronald, Betsy, Donna, George, the Melodic family, Diane, Lisa, Lynn, Bill, Norb, Sandy, Joan, Kathy, Dan, Janet, Ray, Sam and Amy, Joanne, Wayne, Scott, Liz, Bud, Joyce, Ronald, Carla, Merle, Kurt, Laverne, Dorothy, and all whom we lift before you in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed Father, we praise you together with those celebrating special events this week, including those with birthdays, Rod, Karen, Kathy, Eleanor, Calvin, Nancy, Christina, Colin, Margaret, Lynn, Polly, Shannon, and Simon, and those with wedding anniversaries, Tom and Judy. Lord, in your mercy. Grant your continued aid and support, O Lord, to the Reverend Stephen Malberg and his family as they endeavor to reach out with the love of Christ to children and families in Sri Lanka. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, your son, who drew near to eat with sinners, now feeds his people with his own body and blood. Gather your people as a shepherd gathers lost sheep. Remove from them whatever is contrary to sound doctrine and give them repentant hearts that they might rejoice with the angels in heaven. Lord, in your mercy. Most merciful God, remember your baptized children who have wandered from the household of faith. Pursue them as a shepherd who seeks lost sheep. Strengthen their families to persist in prayer and confidence in your faithfulness. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you accomplished your divine will through the lives and deaths of your saints throughout the ages. Comfort all who mourn in our day, especially the family of Dominic Hall. Inspire faith in us through the godly example of those who've gone before us and are with Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, all things are yours, and you have promised to well supply us with all that we need. Give us courage and faith that we may give a confident amen to these prayers, certain that you will give us all that is good and beneficial to our salvation and preserve us from all things harmful. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom, and with whom and in whom be all honor and glory, both now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, 
Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the one true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Amen. God, the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent forth your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and our minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Please be seated. We do have one matter of importance, Noel Weber is here to greet you on behalf of the Board of Stewardship, or no, not Stewardship, Outreach and Social Ministry, talking about Oktoberfest, which of course Wisconsin celebrates in September. Good morning. Oktoberfest is in two weeks, and we need your help with the booth. <clears throat> it is one of the largest fundraisers for the church and school. The booth is located in between Division Street and Paper Valley. We're looking for people to help Friday to pack and load items needed. Saturday, we need help with setup, working the booth, tearing down and putting items away. The shifts are three hour long and you can work as many as you like. Working the booth is fun. It is a great way to let people know about Trinity Lutheran Church and School in Menasha. Right now, we only have a few people signed to work the booth. That is not enough to run the booth all day. If we don't have enough help, we will have to consider canceling the booth uh, this year. <clears throat> um, we have to make the decision by next weekend, so time is of the essence. Please prayerfully consider working the booth. 
We also need help with food donations. There are sign-up sheets on the spinner in the narthex. Thank you and God's blessing on your days. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor, anything on your end? Reminder that next week is our Rally Sunday, which also the committee will be helping with that, uh, along with the Board of Christian Ed. As following the service, there will be a potluck informations in the bulletin for that, as well as we will have a bounce house, a bubble machine, yard games, and other activities that take place. So please come and support the congregation as we kick off our fall uh, Bible studies and Sunday school. Along with that, you're noticing the bulletin on the back page that we're having a welcome shower for Miss Emily Ehlert, our new K-4 teacher, and uh, invite you to bring any type of a food, paper product, or gift card, um, and that will be presented to her next weekend also. Thank you. Let us sing our closing hymn, God's Blessings. Thank you.